July 25th, 527 AM. And um, just, I don't know what to talk about. I just want to get out of here. So let's just talk about this, the stag hunt. Nature and appearance of deer. This is from 1370. Um, the book is Livre de Roy Modus. It's, there's a copy in the National Archives or something like that. Um, it's got lots of illustrations like this, but this one in particular is interesting because it shows twin stags up front, three dogs chasing them, and then you have this man with a horn. So that I think that's the same as the similar to the symbol of the cones that are being used now both horns to make noise, but also a cornucopia idea. And then this shape, whatever this is, a holster or whatever, but it's a heart shape on his right hip. Then the trees in the background, and there's actually, not all the trees in this book look like this, but there are several of them like this. They have a branch chopped off, and it seems like it's always on this side. So from facing it, it's on the left side. So this tree has a branch chopped off, this tree has a branch chopped off, this tree has a branch chopped off. This one almost looks like a woman's breast. This tree almost looks like a woman's figure. And this one just kind of has a, a, a lump on it, but it clearly has the same type of thing going on. So I believe that what this symbolizes is this group who, rather than resolving the system, eliminates a branch from their family tree. That's when I, when I talk about they want to kill me and my whole family, that's what I'm talking about. This is from 1370. So I traced Chris's family tree, the Newman family, the targeted family line, back to about this time, back probably right around this time. Uh, I couldn't trace my targeted family line back that far because it's a female line and probably part of the reason, but um, now is this like the way it goes? Like they just, I mean, I, I just don't know because I don't know how many people have been told that, um, I mean, and if it is, this is from the 1300s. I mean, is this still the way we should be doing things? Of course, I don't think so, but I mean, come on, this is Nazi stuff. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're okay with ch them chopping a branch off of my family tree, which includes me and my daughter and Chris, um, then you should be comfortable with that, them doing that to anybody. And most people aren't. Most people would call that genocide. Um... It doesn't seem like this is the way they've been sold because, you know, if, if, if it were me and I knew that this was what the plan was, because they'd certainly have been lying about it. I don't know who they lie to, though. I don't know who gets... Or if it's not a lie, it's, it's one side thinks it should go this way and another, you know, it's a strategic thing, right? We're playing a game. And in fact, that's where I got this illustration from. I got it from my gaming page. And, and I think that it's fundamentally flawed to see this as a game. Unless you see all wars and things like that as a game. World War II was a game. Like, this this is so far from my perspective. And I, I would, didn't grow up with this mentality. I mean, even though my family did, clearly, and they were hiding it from me. I didn't grow up with this mentality. Like, this kind of thing, this idea that this kind of thing would make any sense. Um, how many people did? is a big question I have. How many people like, think this is just the way things should be? It's a big question I have. Um, but what I was gonna say is if, if you said this to me, like, you know, you're part of this family tree, this family line, and just go along with this program, um, the only way I think you could get a family to participate in this is to tell them that there was a, a different resolution than this. I mean, some people might, and, and this is another thing that I'm going to kind of try to understand, is the way families operate within these systems 
uh, of whatever this is and the trauma-based mind control that's around it. Um, because what I'm now under starting to see is that they don't operate the way I would expect a family to operate. So what I would expect is if you said to me, you know, here you are in the whatever generation, this is a seven generation cycle, you're in the fourth generation and three generations from now, you know, well, you're kind of in prison now, but you can negotiate this and negotiate that. But um, three generations from now, we've got a big prize waiting for, you know, for the, for the, your whatever, great, great granddaughter, great, great grandson or whatever it is. Maybe you would go along with it if you think it's going to be a good prize at the end of the road. Maybe you would go along with it even if you didn't because it's so far ahead of time and you know, you can have lots of kids and some of your family tree is going to be chopped off, but not all of it. Maybe that's okay with you. But from my perspective, what I would do would be to fight it and to say, no, this is not unjust, but especially now, okay, in this day and age when we have a whole system of laws that are accessible to people, we have the internet, we have all these kinds of things where we can actually learn about what our rights are, we can speak out for our rights, and we can show what's happening and, and why it's bad. Um, I wouldn't go along with this program, even if it was, you know, if I was within, I don't think I would, within a few generations, but I don't know. It's, they, they may, a lot of this is done through weird intermarriages and, um, and just brainwashing. And, um, you know, I said yesterday, you can't pretend with this frequency-based mind control that you can resist it, that you even know that it's happening to you. Brainwashing is maybe easier. Maybe you can resist brainwashing, but I think it's hard when it's done on a multi-generational level like this. Um, and, you know, in my case, you know, you're grown up with this surrounded by, you know, something told that it's something else. And um, it's hard to, um, it's hard to see what the truth is. This is from me looking up stag hunt on stag hunt. So first of all, stag hunt is game theory, the study of mathematical models of strategic interaction among rational decision makers. Uh, applications in social science, logic, system science, and computer science. Um, originally, it addressed zero-sum games in which each participant's gains or losses are exactly balanced by those of the other participants. Today, game theory applies to a wide range of behavioral relations and now is an umbrella term for the science of logical decision making in humans, animals, and computers. So it sounds very logical and scientific and so forth and so on, but when you apply it to social situations, I think it can be a problem because, and I'm only saying this because of this situation and what I see as being a fundamental problem here. Um, If you win this game, you're going to lose. So the game theory, it looks like, or at least the way people seem to think about something like this, is um, if something is bad, advantageous to you as an individual, then it's advantageous. But in reality, in society, sometimes something that's not so advantageous to you as an individual is advantageous to society, which means it's going to be advantageous to your children and other family members. And um, so I think that's part of the problem the way of, of people's thinking in this. They put these cones out thinking they're going to um, get this big payoff. But what the payoff is, is mass mind control through frequency-based technologies. Um, genocides happening in order to hide crimes, which is what's going on right now. And genocide might not even be the ideal term because it's not necessarily race based. It's more. It's more about um, let's see, genocide. Genocide, I think, is implies race, and that's not what it is. It's in there. Race is an issue, and race is um, a factor in who gets killed in this because it is white supremacist underlying it. But 
it's not the only factor, and it's probably not even the primary factor. Or it, with some people, it is with a large group of people, especially those of a particular ethnic group or nation. So, so it doesn't have to be an ethnic group. It's just a large group of people. So it is a genocide. This is a genocide. This is I can say unequivocally because now that I see how many people have been um, swept up in this, that this is a genocide. That we are experiencing genocide. Um. Now, I never know to what extent I've convinced people of any of this because of the blacklisting around me, you know, the, the removal of, um, or the violation of my First Amendment rights, free association. And of course, that's part of this because um, people who violate those boundaries, who actually um, support my First Amendment rights, put themselves at risk for genocide, to be swept up in this genocide. And so what, what does happen, well, we'll get to that. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about, okay, what I want to talk about is, is the stag hunt part of what's going on with the cones? And I don't know because one of the things is I haven't been, I haven't been given access to whatever kind of rules. Now, I don't believe that rules should, the rules are valid around this. I think that there's a rule book that people think that they need to go by. It's not valid. To me, the only thing that's valid is the, the laws and ethics, um, but at the same time, this is a show of power. And so um, part of the show of power is to force people to go along with some rule book, but this is a rule book that I haven't even had access to. That makes it unfair. It doesn't matter if it's unfair, I guess, because this is a show of power. Now who's holding this rule book and who's deciding all of this? I don't even know that. I know Freemasons are involved at a very high level in this. I don't know that they're involved at the highest level because this is older than Freemasonry. Um, aristocratic society is involved in this at a high level. I don't know if they have maybe their own, um, you know, I hear people sort of referring to a Supreme Court or something like that. Um, if, it's a, if it's a court, it's a secret court and it's not familiar to me. The laws, whatever they're working from is not familiar to me. Um, the whole thing doesn't make sense to me, but, um, so, you know, I guess my strategy has been to work as much as I can within that, but not to let that rule me because I really think that we should be ruled by laws, by the laws of our country, unless the laws of the country are fundamentally unjust. And I don't know whether the rules of this so-called Supreme Court are fundamentally unjust or not, because I don't have access to them. If they are fundamentally unjust, then I don't think we should go by them. But I have no idea. So, for example, if they were, if they're saying that they won't let me out or they won't, um, you know, support my rights to anything because I'm not a man, I would say that's fundamentally unjust. Um, I think that uh, allowing people to to uh, libel me. Is fundamentally unjust. I think allowing people to sex traffic me is fundamentally unjust. Um, and those are the things that have been going on. So how how is that happening? Is it that this so-called Supreme Court is allowing it, or that this so-called Supreme Court can't somehow can't do anything about it? Um, in which case, who can do something about it? Certainly, the police could do something about it. Um, and if the police don't do anything about it, is it because of their links to Freemasonry? Or is it because, I think it, I, I think it is, because the fact that they've, you know, say they've been involved in the crime up until now, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to say, um, stop. We've, st we've got to stop doing these crimes. We've got to stop supporting these crimes. We've got to stop allowing other people to do these crimes. It's causing too much damage to our society, to our country. Um, that could happen, but it's not happening. And so something else is something else is controlling all of that. So there's a lot of still after all this time, tons and tons of questions that I have about this. But if it, let's just say that there's a game 
at work, okay? Certainly from the Freemason point of view, it's a game. I don't know if it's a game from the Supreme Court point of view, you know, let's call it the Supreme Court. It's not the, the Supreme Court. It's not the United States Supreme Court, but some other court that may or may not exist. Um, is it a game to them? Usually court, I mean, even though attorneys might see a court case as a game, usually if your life, you're the one whose life is on the line, you're not seeing it as a game. You're seeing it as a struggle for survival. Um, and unless, you know, unless you look at human beings as equivalent to objects or things like this aren't, aren't seen as games, but I know that people are looked at as objects and that's kind of been illustrated in, in my dreams, even going back to 1983. So sometimes what my dreams communicate is another person's point of view of things. And, and sometimes it's people are like little objects to be played with in a game. Human lives. So stag hunt, the basic idea of it. I don't understand the mathematics of it. And here's the, where the illustration was. It's about social cooperation. And so apparently there is a choice. A group of hunters have a, tracked a large stag and have followed it to a certain path. If all the hunters work together, they can all kill the stag and eat. If they are discovered or do not cooperate, the stag will go free and all will go hungry. The hunters hide and wait along a path. An hour goes by with no sign of the stag. Two, three, four hours pass with no trace. A day passes. The stag may not pass every day, but the hunters are reasonably certain that it will come. However, a hare is seen by the hunters moving along the path. If a hunter leaps out and kills the hare, he will eat. But the trap laid for the stag will be wasted and all the other hunters will starve. There is no certainty that the stag will arrive. The hare is present. The dilemma is that if one hunter waits, he risks one of his fellows killing the hare for himself, sacrificing everyone else. This makes the risk twofold, the risk that the stag does not appear and the risk that another hunter takes the kill. So it's not clear to me why killing the rabbit means you don't get the stag and it's not entirely clear to me how this applies to the situation that I'm in, but it might sort of apply with having to do with the things that happened to Brett and to Kurt Cobain. So there's a, been a series of murders. There's been lots of murders. There's been some high profile murders or murders that are more, more impactful in terms of the game. And Brett is one. And I think um, part of the importance of Brett is that so many people were involved. Part of the importance of Brett is the way he was trafficked from a hospital room in a coma for as long as he was in. Um, his obituary said 15 and a half years, I believe. I think something like that. I don't know if that's correct. I don't know how much we have cover up. There seems like been quite a lot of cover up around him. What, so people made money from that. And people make money from what happened to Kurt Cobain or get influence. It's not just money. They also get influence and progress up in the crime game. Who's the stag and what's the stag and is it um, is it like us coming out? And then in that case, what's the payoff? The payoff is, it seems like it's either or, right? The payoff is that there's a change in power and the old system goes away and there's something new and hopefully better comes along. And certainly if I was, you know, given the power to end this crime, I would end it. I would not, if I was given some type of, you know, king-like power, I would not use it that way. I wouldn't shape society with assassinations. I wouldn't use trauma-based mind control um, and all those horrible things that you do to children to um, turn them into these <laughs> butterflies. 
and not just children, but animals and animals and things like that. I wouldn't do that. Um, um, I would want to have more openness around that kind of thing so that if people were experiencing that, they would be aware, or other types of mind control, they would be aware um, through being educated. And I would, you know, reduce this emphasis on control and um, emphasize instead education, critical thinking, training, things like that. This is, this is the kinds of things that I would do. Because I do believe, you know, things like the First Amendment only work if properly if they work properly for everyone. And right now, it's not working properly for everyone. There is there is some serious suppression going on. So what that means is you get these disinformation agents out there and saying a bunch of garbage, and there's no real counter to it because um, people are self-suppressing the truth. So then the First Amendment is just used to spew lies. It's only used to protect lies and not the truth. That's what's kind of going on right now in certain cases, in this case, for example. So I think there would be a lot of p positive payoff for people who don't want to live in fear or under a state of control or in a crime, you know, in a world that, ruled by crime to turn this over and allow me to have whatever um, place is supposed to be reserved. And not to be hung up on the fact that I'm female instead of a male. Not to be hung up on the fact that um, my daughter is Native American. And it's actually a bit shocking to me, actually, that Natives would be working against us, considering that, you know, if this were to be passed down, if this is a, a something that's passed down in a family line, that... Um, my daughter is Native American. I would think that what you would want to do would be to support my daughter and, and not to manipulate her and not to abuse her and not to traffic her, to actually support her and to um, help her um, flourish. Um, but it seems like this has been twisted into this predatory thing where people are only seen in terms of their value like as meat, right? either um, to be trafficked, to be killed. And that's part of what the mind control has taught people. That's all by, I'm sure that's all by design. So when this, you know, as far as the stag appearing, how does the, what happened to Brett and what happened to Kurt Cobain and other people like that affect that? Um, and one way that it affects it is that the people who have been involved in these murders are working very hard to keep the murder system going because it, I, presumably because they're protected by it or they feel they're protected by it. And they're concerned that if that, you know, that system is removed, then their protection will be removed and they'll be held accountable for their actions. Um, so one of the things I've suggested is amnesty, but it, you know all the suggestions that I've made don't seem to make any difference. And I'm not a huge fan of um, just blanket amnesty anyway, because especially for people who have been working from this level of entitlement, because they don't appreciate it, they just expect it. They expect to be able to commit crimes and get away with it. Um, they don't see it as being an act of grace so much as an act of weakness. So I don't think it should be the first thing you do. Um, however, it shouldn't be off the table either, especially if you can make progress. I mean, the goal should be to make progress in society and to, to make things better from my perspective. Um, but as far as, you know, how does this apply to the stag hunt situation? It seems like what the goal has been, okay, what it really is, is that they feel that they need to get everybody on board with this idea of we, they've got to kill us all, right? We've got, to, we've got to eliminate this branch off the family tree and then we'll just move on to the next group and everything will be fine. So in my case, presumably, this would move over to the daughters of my cousin, Christy. Okay, her daughters would, would be the ones that were then trafficked and abused and mind controlled and things like that. And 
weirdly, they all seem to be fine with that. And I'm not sure that they had even have a choice because I think they're all locked into organized crime anyway. So they just um, they just work within that realm. They don't. I don't think they actually envisioned that that could actually end for them. That they would not have to work within that crime system. And maybe because they've lived in it for so long, they're used to it and they like it. I don't know. But um, I certainly would not want to think about, you know, my future generations having to deal with this. Um, so they want to get everybody on board with this idea of killing off my family. Um, and that's what I think the stag hunt comes into play because it's this idea of, of cooperation, right? Getting everybody to cooperate on a common goal. It says here that several animal behaviors have been described as stag hunts. One is the coordination of slime molds. This is one of these things on Wikipedia that is not sourced. Um, so I don't know who describes slime molds as being stag hunts, but it says, in times of stress, individual unicellular protests will aggregate to form one large body. So it's that word body. So body meaning multiple people or multiple entities or multiple organisms together, working together. If they all act together, they can successfully reproduce, but success depends on the coordination of many individual protozoa. So slime molds, I guess, are a bunch of um, individual single-celled animals working together as a cooperative group. Um, and then they say orcas also have that type of behavior. So then if I look at slime molds, because um, that caught my attention. The reason why it caught my attention is because of this Nickelodeon, the Nickelodeon show and how they were always sliming people. This stuff called slime that was a toy came out in the 1970s. It was just a green goo. Uh, it was really popular. Um, it came out in 1976, I guess, so when I was in grade school, so I definitely remember it. And anyway, but then in 79, starting in 79, this TV station Nickelodeon started to um, do this thing where they were dumping, quote unquote, green slime on people. And it makes me think that that actually is linked to this idea of stag hunt and cooperation, and it's more than what they said it was. Yeah, it's funny, ooey gooey green stuff, but, and green's linked with mind control. The color green is linked with mind control. So the slime mold is a model of cooperation. And green, the color linked with mind control. I think this is very much about planning to get everybody together on board with this idea of killing off my whole family. But of course, they make it seem fun. And it also shows you how children, you know, that incorporation of children is so important. Because if you get children conditioned to the stuff so early on, it seems normal to them. So then I read about slime mold on Wikipedia. And so it explains their behavior. When a solid mold mass or mound is physically separated, the cells find their way back to reunite. That I found really interesting because I remember this lesson from biology one, you know, 101 or whatever, the early biology classes. I took my, um, I originally was going to study biology in college. When I was at Humboldt State, I intended to be a bio biology major. And I took my first classes in my first class in biology from Gary Brasca. So Gary was the one that talked about this. And I remember him talking about this in terms, he was talking about a sponge. Now that too is very interesting because SpongeBob SquarePants was created by a Humboldt State student, Humboldt State marine biology student. And Gary Brasca was Humboldt State marine biology. So I know that, and Gary, you know, there's the snail named Gary and SpongeBob. So I know that Gary had to have been, he, you know, Stephen Hillen, Hillenberg, is his name? Um, it had to, probably it was his advisor. He certainly worked with him. There's no doubt that he worked with him. Um, in fact, I think that a lot of SpongeBob was based on those old stomatopod magazines.
but uh, Gary talked about running a sponge through a sieve and then the, the, the single cells of the sponge would form together. I think it was Gary that talked about that. It would go back and form, you know, they'd find their ways back to form the sponge again. Um, So slime molds are no more than a bag of amoeba encased in a thin slime sheath, yet they manage to have various behaviors that are equal to those of animals who possess muscles and nerves. Okay, well, it's simple brain. So it's this idea of making a giant brain out of a lot of smaller brains and things like that. Um, so harnessing people, using mind control, though, I think, you know, to harness people to, to a single task. And in this case, the task is to kill off a family. Um, and to also keep a lot of other murders and crimes quiet. So I think that's what um, people are trying to pull off with these um, the cars, the renovations, and the murders.